We'll go ahead and get started with Acorn Hypervisor and Zephyr Artos for industrial IoT applications. And hopefully by the end of this talk, it'll be a quick one, uh, just 30 minutes, uh, but I'll try and leave some time for questions at the end. Um, but I'm hoping that we can answer what is this? How do you use it in Zephyr? And start thinking about what you can do with it. Um, what are some of the motivating use cases that could happen in the real world? Here we go. All right, so just to start out with a little bit about me and why I'm touching on this space. Um, I'm an engineer in sensor systems for over 10 years now. Uh, had to think about it, it's been a long time. Uh, and then I've been with the Zephyr project as a developer for about two years now, focusing on x86 platform enabling and architecture. And I also have a keen interest on usability, sensing, and disruptive technology, positive disruption, something that can be transformative for the industry, whichever industry it is. Um, and so um, I've got a couple of fun pictures there and feel free to ask me about them. <laughs> we can talk about them offline. I love the passion projects. Um, but today I wanted to talk about um, one of the use cases for uh, two open source deliveries. Um, we have Acorn Hypervisor and Zephyr Artos, and they can both be used together on x86 based platforms. And it's been done a couple times in the past. We've seen it with UpSquared and a couple other platforms, and we're showing Showing with this talk that we're actually keeping up with the growth of the open source open source ecosystem to meet the real time requirements for embedded and virtualized systems as it comes out with newer platforms. And one of those that we'll talk about today is Elkhart Lake. And so um, one of the topics for this as well is flexibility with scalability. We know that with these uh, IoT applications, especially, the intent is not to have just one device connected. It's going to end up being something that's very scalable, very customizable, and is going to be applicable to different use cases. And so we can look at the hypervisor support to uh, kind of extend that virtualization idea across different platforms. So it doesn't just have to be upsquared, and it doesn't just have to be Elkhart Lake. It could be something else. So um, that's kind of the idea behind that flexibility and scalability and combining both of these open source projects. And of course, um, something that we can dive into later as well is how this is enabled by the permissive license um, so that we have reference source code and device drivers to enable the entire ecosystem to support that hardware and virtualization. So diving into the concept a bit more for the hardware and different deployments. And I picked Elkhart Lake for an example here because it required SOC and board definition for these PC-like boards like Elkhart Lake um, in the RTOS ecosystem that are easily adaptable and upstreamed. So for instance, there's the typical bare metal or EFI BIOS implementation, but then also um, we've seen Slim Bootloader involved with that configuration for booting and then also using this on top of Acorn. So we can see that on the right hand side, how you can build up different uh, board definitions for this um, particular hardware. And this also does show us that, um, you know, I just wanted to highlight on this slide, the far left is where you can have a multi-chip package. So the idea behind scalability and flexibility is looking at the SOC and the board and putting those pieces together in a customized way so you can achieve what you need for your design objectives. And looking closer at the virtualization, we want to, I'll just start with the, um, the left hand side here. Um, so we want to combine these two, the hypervisor and the real time operating system, so we can have isolated virtual machines for the environment for these operating systems, and then also have the real time capabilities. And I am hoping that you all are attending different sessions to learn more about all of that as far as uh, Zephyr Artos goes and the capabilities, features, and um, development that's happening there. Um, and then Acorn is a large project as well. So if you want to learn more about that development, I urge you to check it out too. Um, but then looking at this, we talked about flexibility and scalability, but there's also reliability and being customizable. And the idea for this, and we'll dive into that picture on the right, it's a bit of an eye chart at first, but it'll make sense when we dive in. The idea is that you can have multiple operating systems. That's why we have the isolated virtual machines. And 
say one operating system may crash, it may have a fault or it may panic, and you want to have the other operating system relatively unaffected. And you can decide if what your design objectives are, how you handle that situation. But at the highest level, if one fails, you want the other one to be unaffected. Um, and we can see this going into some of the use cases, especially for safety, but we'll talk about that a bit later. And so on the diagram on the right, we see that there's a couple of things, and I'll see if I can use my mouse to show you here. Um, this is the hybrid real-time scenario. It's a, it's a certain scenario for ACORN, and there's a lot of information available. So you can um, read more about that, or we can talk about it. Um, but it's focused on real-time capabilities. And um, we're looking at Zephyr RTOS, that'll be over here on the left, as a pre-launched uh, user VM. So here's the Zephyr. And um, we're doing this as a pre-launched real-time user VM. Then on the right hand side, you can see an example service VM. So this might be something like Ubuntu. We've seen that in a couple power. demos. Uh, that there is lots of solar power in the grid. I and think I'm hearing system. something else. Okay, thank you. All right, um, so uh, we have over here, this might be Ubuntu, it might be something larger. Uh, it may be running some more user VMs, um, different things like that. Lots of capabilities provided by this architecture. And what we want to consider here is that um, the pre-launch means that we're going to have the, everything boot at the beginning. It's not going to be booted later by the main OS or the service OS. It'll um, be launched all at one time for this example, but there are post launch configurations as well uh, where you can have the service VM or Ubuntu boot up all the way and then you as a user might come in and trigger the the boot up of Zephyr. So um, lots of different ways to put that together. Um, so we can always talk about that too. Uh, so there is existing development, like I mentioned, so you can check it out on Acorn and Zephyr. Um, and let's take a look at how we can actually use this in Zephyr. So on the left hand side, um, you can use the upstream code as it is, and you can build using our typical uh, West build functions and use Acorn Elkhart Lake CRB. And you can use this, I've put hello world, but I've been using it personally for testing uh, very heavily and um, for different tests and samples. And uh, so this was just a starting point for you. Um, then there's also um, a step that we'll need to configure and build Acorn. And that's been detailed, uh, special thanks to Andy Ross for putting that together um, to detail how we can configure ACORN specifically uh, because it is going to be its own uh, binary and set of multi-boot configured uh, files that we need to boot up at the beginning. And so that's, that's a step, uh, several steps that we need to do, but so I didn't capture that here. The focus is more about using Zephyr. So I've just put a link there that you can check out the documentation if you want to build Zephyr or build Acorn. Um, but then we also need to assemble the EFI boot media. That's something like a bootable USB device. And that's similar to how we um, are booting other x86 platforms like UpSquared. And then we just need to boot Acorn. And since Acorn is going to be the first thing to boot, and then it will uh, take control of the system, and then we'll launch Zephyr as one of those next OSs. And I have also put a sample here where um, you can incorporate Twister, which is our testing framework, and use that with this, pl this platform as well. And uh, if you have it connected, um, you can use West Flash command to have your own um, scripting that can execute the boot media instructions and flashing or just flashing the board, as it says, West Flash. And there's more information on the uh, Zephyr documentation as well about West Flash and how you can use that for different platforms. Um, it's very handy for doing um, heavy testing. And then on the right, I do have uh, in the purple box an example that is also a talking point um, going forward. Since this was a short talk, I wanted to give a lot of points to bring up later in your conversations. Um, but this was, um, 
this topic was actually brought up uh, just last year at Embedded World 2020. Canonical had a booth for Ubuntu running in parallel with Zephyr Artos uh, on top of Acorn. And they used an Intel NUC and reserved a core and a small amount of memory for Zephyr. And the rest of the system resources were for Ubuntu as the service VM. And Acorn, as I mentioned, takes system control on boot and then starts Zephyr and Ubuntu. And then um, Zephyr output was on a small display and Ubuntu was on a larger display. One moment, let me get some water. Spring in Oregon, allergies are everywhere. <laughs> um, so uh, Zephyr is also, um, we're dem what's demonstrated in that booth, and we can continue this effort, uh, is to have Zephyr unaffected by the additional Ubuntu payload. So they had some timing critical um, operations going in Zephyr, and when Ubuntu had an issue, Zephyr was able to continue um, uh, unaffected, um, like if Ubuntu was had a heavy workload, Zephyr did not slow down. So that was uh, the demonstration there. And so now I wanted to get to some of the motivating use cases um, in industrial IoT. Um, it can be, this is a broad space and even diving into each of these categories is a broad space within itself. It, it can depend on the application and where you are in, uh, in the infrastructure. So first is manufacturing and then logistics, utilities, oil and gas, and smart buildings. And you can extend smart buildings to smart cities. And you can also um, consider utilities as things that are um, part of smart cities as well. Um, so it's kind of interesting to start seeing the overlap between these use cases and consider how we may need to uh, be extremely flexible and scalable as we apply these technologies. And so next I have a couple of um, just short animations uh, to try and demonstrate uh, some of the controls or flows that might employ this kind of technology. Um, and so uh, I'm hoping that this can start um, turning some gears and get people thinking about um, the actual end use of this and maybe replace these boxes with something more, more meaningful, uh, maybe something that is safety critical like pharmaceuticals. But for now, this is just some boxes. And if we look here in each of these, uh, each of these windows, uh, we have the two operating systems is what I'm trying to show that one is for the main processing. It's your service VM. It can be something like uh, Ubuntu. And then over on the right is going to be the robotic arm. Um, and I'm pointing on the wrong <laughs> screen here, but um, this, uh, so two operating systems to run this equipment, and this might be something on the manufacturing floor. And the left is the service VM, the bigger one, and then the robotic arm is something maybe Zephyr Artos could control. And if everything's working great, then we have these, both operating systems are happy, things are going well, and um, it just continues on its process. The box doesn't usually just fly from the ceiling, but <laughs> that's just for, it doesn't loop right now. Um, but then there's um, the broken and unaffected state, right? So we talked about how one of the motivating ideas is that if one operating system fails or has way too heavy of a payload, you don't want the other one to be affected. So um, in this demonstration, we'll show that um, it will, one is failing and the other one is going to just proceed. It's it's unaffected. The robot arm keeps going. The belt keeps going. But then we consider what if the system failing, one of the service VMs failing, if that may have a safety implication, maybe um, pharmaceuticals, something is going to spill or there's someone on the floor. Um, there's any number of things. Then maybe we want to have a safe stop. So instead of continuing the cycle and letting the equipment keep going, despite the processor on the other side of the OS, then we might want to consider coming to a safe position that's predetermined and the other VM may just need to be in a different state so everyone is aware that 
it needs that something needs to be done um, and perhaps the the boxes just stop right in a safe place um, and so that's kind of um, a few things to think about in case it didn't make sense from the other picture and walking through the different uh, operating systems in the architecture diagram and then so I'm actually at the wrap up and I don't have a clock visible to me. Uh, I think we've got plenty of time for questions though. Um, so just to wrap things up, I wanna uh, just mention again that this is the, um, we're using Elkhart Lake, it's upstreamed on Zephyr Project and using that on top of Acorn as a device hypervisor for industrial IoT. And it is an amazing opportunity for us to uh, grow and um, offer that flexibility and customization that's needed for delivering across these different applications and recognizing that it needs to be done in a way that is mindful of um, some of these safety critical applications as well, especially in these spaces for industrial. Uh, it's large scale, large equipment, and a lot of moving parts, and um, also a lot of money involved with mistakes and mishaps. So um, with all of that in mind, uh, I did provide some links uh, for you to check out some more things, including the, um, the Zephyr project uh, blog posts uh, that are about the demonstrations for this technology in the past. And um, feel free to reach out in uh, after this if you have any questions too. Um, but I guess at this time, I'll open the floor for uh, some questions. So Jen, there's a question in the chat. Uh, is it possible to access the GPU from the Linux guest when running on top of Acorn? Yes. Uh, Jennifer, could could you speak to uh, any thoughts or efforts about, and this is a very high level question, decoupling Acorn from x86 architecture? And, and what that means is it, it would be nice if there was a similar open source um, virtualization layer um, available on a other architectures? That's a great question. And I am going to have to, you know, look into that uh, offline and we can certainly follow up and we can reach out to Acorn as well and, and find out what they uh, may have to say uh, in response to that. I think that's a very interesting question and certainly would uh, fit well with uh, Zephyr as we support different architectures. And that's just, very appealing from uh, our perspective that we're not tied to one specific architecture. Actually, we can't because we have a, a variety of architectures that we use internally, and there's a lot of appeal with both open source, Acorn, and Zephyr um, uh, kind of um, uh, working together and so forth. So. Yeah, that would be an interesting thing to look at. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yes, I mean, I know that they do have a number of the drivers virtualized and it may be a matter of um, working with their configurations and seeing how we can do that. Um, I'd be curious to look into that too. Uh, another question I see. Oh, Andy. <laughs> so Jen, the, the chat isn't captured in the recording, and so I recommend that you uh, read out the question before you answer it so the context is clear. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so we have this question. Did you have an instance where the hypervisor itself had issues at runtime and how that affected the hosted VMs? Uh, yes, uh, we did. <laughs> uh, I think that um, we've had a number, uh, a small number of bugs that are related to interrupts, especially um, where we've needed to identify uh, a couple of configurations for the interrupts and the 
IRQ systems that we were using in Zephyr and trying to pass and communicate with Acorn. So um, I think it has happened and um, we ended up having a bug that we detected with our testing suite uh, since that is equipped. Uh, you know, we can use uh, the Z test framework and we're using Twister with Acorn. Uh, so quickly caught it and started investigating with a bug on GitHub and um, you know, we reached out. We In another case, we needed to reach out to Acorn and get some feedback and they were quick to reply. So it's, it's great collaboration and we resolved the issue quickly. So I think this, this is a, a great opportunity for us to um, try and uh, answer some of those questions with actual implementations. Thanks for your question. I'm looking at the chat for questions and I don't see any popping up. There's some comments. Um, shall I read the comments? I'll leave that up to you, Jen. OK, um, so Andy has uh, made a, you know, a clarification and, you know, I, I appreciate the clarification uh, and Andy's been a tremendous help with understanding the complexities of integrating these. Um, and in some cases, the integration is straightforward. In some cases, we do need to think more critically and we need to identify um, maybe some uh, incomplete emulation of the virtual hardware or the instruction states. Um, and so uh, the actual hypervisor um, seems to be quite reliable and um, you know, we're, we're using it um, heavily with the testing suites. Are there any questions? There's a new question in the chat. Uh, are there any plans to add a driver for um, I-915 and Zephyr. I don't know the answer to that, um, but we can, um, if you'd like, you can post that question uh, in the mailing list for the development and we can we can start exercising yeah, that. I, I oh, and Andy's here, and, and, wonderful. You, you, I'm sorry, I was fumbling for headphones. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, under no circumstances. I mean, uh, you, if you want graphics, you, you know, run Linux as a guest and that actually works. Uh, you know, they've, they've booted Ubuntu with it and it works just fine. Um, and and uh, uh, I, 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 I'd love to see someone play with a Zephyr frame buffer. I, I just don't think that's uh, <laughs> that's not in scope for anything that anyone's trying to use Zephyr for right now. Thanks, Andy. And we have another question. We can use Acorn in Ubuntu machine, any hardware. Um, so, oh, sorry, go ahead, Maureen. I was just going back down, back into mute. I didn't oh. have anything. <laughs> Thank you, no worries. Maybe I can take this back to show the architecture one more time to help answer this question. Uh, so what we would see is that we have one platform and it'll have a multi-core system, um, or I mean, we could we can discuss that, but I've seen it um, most recently in multi-core system. And so what we have is some of the resources are designated for this service VM, and some are for the um, for the the user VM. And but they both do sit atop of Acorn, and Acorn is atop of the hardware. So um, hopefully that helps demonstrate what we're talking about here with like Ubuntu would be uh, running atop of Acorn and Zephyr would be running atop of Acorn. And Jennifer, I'm sorry if you already covered this. What what's the minimum x86 like uh, hardware level that we would need to run Zephyr? I mean, sorry, uh, Acorn. So uh, we could we could look at their supported boards and the supported um, minimum architectures there. Um, Oh, that, sure. that could so I could go to the open source project and they should have uh, a list of supported boards and 
maybe not supported boards or. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Is this support in Zephyr tightly coupled to Acorn, or could it also be used with another hypervisor? I would think that we could work on development. Um, maybe we could talk about that for using another hypervisor. Um, Andy, do you think there's anything that's tightly coupled? No, I mean, y y in point of fact, we don't really like we have we don't have any virtual any any para virtualized drivers for acorn right now we're we're just touching stuff that they're emulating like serial ports for example they're that they're emulating for us so yeah we would we would run just fine under other things and in fact occasionally people talk about trying to set up zephyr under kbm as as like a ci uh, kind of thing to speed up the death suite um it 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 shouldn't be prop hard i mean the integration that we do have obviously is all board level and it's all um, about the particular hardware that they're presenting to us and having device trees for that. So I, I, I don't think there's any fundamental problems. It's a x86 Zephyr, and this has nothing to do with Acorn. x86 Zephyr is a little bit of a pain point right now because configuring the hosts is difficult because we are not Linux and we're not Windows and we don't fully probe ACPI and and we don't read from the, the runtime probable stuff that PCs have been using for decades. We expect it all kind of upfront. So you kind of need to configure Zephyr for every individual board. Yeah, but that's again, that's no different for Acorn than it is for any of the other x86 boards. Thank you so much, Andy. That really helps. OK, well, thank you, Jen. I think we're about out of time. Uh, appreciate your presentation today and thanks everyone for joining. Uh, enjoy the rest of the summit. Thank you so much.